All right, hi everyone. I think we can start. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Irina and actually uh, I gave similar talk this year in Pittsburgh and when I got an email from Drupal con Lille that my session was accepted, I thought that I thought that well it's kind of it feels like a mission for this year for me uh, to be here and speak about our experience as a Ukrainian. So thanks everyone for joining today. And I have my co-speaker today, Anastasia. Uh, her name can be spelled as Stasia, <laughs> so I'll call her Stasia today. And uh, we'll be covering the topic that you see on the screen about wartime period for Ukrainian teams and challenges that we had in 2022 and keep having in 2023 and lessons that we learned. So yeah. a few words about myself. Uh, as I said, my name is Irina. I am Ukrainian. I came here to you from the city of heroes, Mykolaiv. It really, it's located in the south of Ukraine. Unfortunately, it's quite near the front line. Uh, however, speaking about my experience, I've been in IT for almost 10 years. Seven years I'm working as a project manager. Three out of these seven years I've been uh, managing Drupal projects, and uh, I'm a happy mother of 11 years old son. Stasia. Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming. Yeah, my name is Anastasia, but as Irina mentioned, everyone can call me Stasia. I'm also Ukrainian, but I'm currently living in Istanbul in Turkey, and I have been living there for two and a half years. I actually moved there before the war started, just because it was my childhood dream. Speaking about my experience, I'm working in management for six years, and three of them were devoted to Drupal projects. And if someone would ask me to describe myself in a few words, I would definitely say that I'm an adventure seeker and traveler. I really enjoy going to new countries, meeting people from all over the world. And by the way, France is one of my favorite European countries, and I'm very excited to visit Lille for the first time. All right, uh, this is not the last slide of the presentation, but uh, I just want to say, and Stasia as well, thank you to everyone who came today, because we understand this is not a technical session and we're not going to share any technical news here. However, we will be able to share our stories as Ukrainians. And uh, again, thank you all for joining this session today. All right, speaking about the agenda, um, I'd like to start from immersing you a bit into the atmosphere of morning of February 24, 2022, and uh, our first week of wartime. Next, we'll talk about company's challenges, support, and lessons we learned as a team and as a company. Uh, next, I'll share a few real stories about developers who become volunteers and at the same time they are defenders of our country. Next, um, I'll try to show, and Stasi as well, <laughs> and I like to answer question how are we now and how we are preparing for one more challenging winter season, winter 23-24. And uh, finally, we'll talk about how we are backing our teams. And if you have Ukrainian colleagues working with you on your projects, or maybe you have friends from Ukraine and you don't know how to support them, how to talk to them, we'll try to share some ways on how you can support your Ukrainian teammates or colleagues. Let's go. Uh, to immerse you a bit into the atmosphere, I'd like you to Imagine the evening of February 23. So you finish your working day. You said thank you for one more productive day to your colleagues. You had a dinner with your loved ones and wish good night to your kids. And this is the most hard part for me. <laughs> and then morning of February 24, started. So for me, this morning started at 5.20 a.m. I woke up actually to the sound of first time for me. <laughs> I didn't notice actually what was that. 
At 5.30 a.m. I sent a telegram message to my best friend. I said to her, listen, <laughs> I woke up to the sound of explosions. At 5.40, I sent a message to my mom, and it was quite a naive message from me, because I said to her that we probably won't be taking my son to the school today. And frankly speaking, February 23, 2022, was the last day my son visited his school offline. At 5.50, I opened my work in Slack, and I realized that the whole team that I was working with that time were already discussing ways of evacuation and were saying we have never ever discussed anything at 5 a.m. in the morning in the working chat, but the whole group was there already. At 6 a.m., my partner and I, we started packing our bags. We tried to search for cash because honestly, we knew that something was going to happen but we couldn't believe it would happen in reality. Uh, next four slides will represent uh, real pictures, and I would like to say that none of these images are intended to make you feel upset. You may find them chilling. Uh, however, I do want to share the experience, just maybe share some piece of atmosphere that we had a few years ago. Uh, first slide is about emergency suit cases. Here you have, you, you can see three real images. These are the stuff that people were trying to put together, including their loved ones. And uh, this is how, I would say, the most of the bags of Ukrainian look like in the morning of February 24. Uh, next one, this is a traffic congestion. Uh, actually, this is an evacuation, because for some of the Ukrainians, morning started earlier than for me, and you may see that it's kind of night period and people were trying to get to the gas station, uh, some of the people were trying to get out of epicenters, and this is how it looked like. Uh, these two images, they were provided to me by my colleague, QA engineer. This is her car, and this is her hand, and this is a bullet hole in the car that they get during the evacuation and they were trying to move from Kyiv to the west of Ukraine. And lastly, uh, these are real images. That's me in front of the government building in Mykolaiv. This is my best friend in front of business center, former business center slash hotel uh, in, in my native city. Stasia? Thank you, Irina. Right now I'm going to show you the opposite side. For those who just joined, I just mentioned that I'm living in Turkey. So when the war started, I was not in Ukraine. And it is somewhat surprising, but I have found out that the war started a little bit earlier than some of my friends in Ukraine. And the reason of it was that in Ukraine, we have a group chat with all of my friends who are located throughout the whole country. And some of my friends woke up earlier than others because of the explosion sounds. So my phone was literally blowing and uh, ringing nonstop. So needless to say how scared and terrified I was when I woke up and read all of those messages. The first thought that came through my mind was that it's a nightmare. It's something absolutely cannot be happening. But then the reality hit so hard and I realized that the goal number one for me was to take care of the safety of my mom, who was living in Ukraine that time all by her own. And I was trying to convince her to immediately evacuate to Turkey, which I can say that it was not an easy task because as many of my friends and relatives, my mom didn't even consider the possibility to leave her home and to move to nowhere. Uh, but the, and also everyone was hoping for the best, you know, everyone was, everyone was thinking that this conflict will be resolved quickly and it will not turn into a full-scale invasion. But then after three weeks of hiding in the bomb shelters and testing my nerve system, my mom finally made the decision and started her seven days road to me. At this moment, I was searching and trying to set up some walkie-talkie and location-sharing applications so that I can always stay in touch with my loved ones, no matter what, despite of power outages or lost connections. And that time, I didn't even know that, that such applications exist, but they actually do. And also, I wanted to mention that 
I consider myself being very lucky because I didn't see the war with my own eyes. I didn't hear the sirens or the bomb explosions. But at the same time, it was indescribably hard to be so far away from my relatives, from my friends and family without even knowing how can I provide, how I can provide physical actual help for them. And that's why uh, at that moment, me and my Ukrainian friends from Turkey, we started joining volunteering communities so that we can support Ukraine by raising donations, by attending rallies and delivering humanitarian aids to Ukraine. I also wanted to share some images. This one is from the Istanbul rallies that we attended. And I want to mention that about 30 or I would say 40% of people who participated there were foreigners and particularly Turkish people and I'm beyond grateful to that, to that country and to those people who uh, not, be, not become only my shelter but also my second family. And here a couple of images from the volunteering community that we attended. Of course, it's just a drop in the ocean comparing to what we actually delivered because buses were going non-stop back and forth. And we gathered everything, started from food and clothes, ending up with medicines or medical and war equipment to help our soldiers. And if we were asked to summarize how was our week of, I usually call it week of, our morning of February 24, uh, I would highlight probably the five main things that we did during the first week. Uh, when the war started, I was working in another company, at FFW agency, and we had uh, a global chat where all team members were there. And the first thing that I did in the morning when I was staying in the <laughs> car jam, traffic jam, I, sat, uh, I sent a message to the um, Slack channel with the global team letting everyone know that this morning Russia invaded Ukraine and if you have any Ukrainian colleagues working with you on the projects they will probably won't be available this morning and uh, the whole day uh, and they do need your support today. Uh, we created a dedicated Slack channel where all the team members, not just Ukrainian, were able to post updates, share feedback, share thoughts, news, ask for help, anything. Uh, we have informed our clients for sure, so we released statements uh, and we were not trying to hide any information. We were just sharing updates as they were, uh, sharing the actual situation that this happened in the morning. Uh, we delivered information about how many team members are available, how many of them are not available, and just try to plan our next steps at least for the next few days. Uh, team members started relocating to safer places. Those ones who were allowed to move abroad, mostly women and children, uh, they were tried to move to the European country, mostly Poland, Moldova, Romania for the first time. Those ones, mostly men, who were not allowed to cross the board and they are still not allowed to go abroad, they were trying to move with their families to the west of Ukraine. And finally, we tried to get over the shock and start building the continuity plan so that we can at least try to project the upcoming weeks of our lives. Thank you. Uh, now we would like to discuss the challenges that companies faced during the wartime, how they support their team and the lessons learned. But before we start discussing some practical information, we wanted to share some statistics provided by IT Ukraine Association and Top LLC report. Uh, top lead LLC report, sorry. The war has proved to become a real test for the whole IT industry. However, according to the survey, 34.3% of the companies have successfully adapted to the new realities and 9 out of 10 companies managed to maintain more than 80% of their business processes. So what challenges companies actually faced and how they overcame them? First of all, stayed in touch with the team. When the war started, our team was interviewed to ensure that we have all necessary information about every single team member, about their partners and their family members. We should have known exactly what they are going to do in case of emergency. How would they evacuate by their own car or do they need any help? As well as we created a communication channel where everyone can share what's going on around and uh, get support and ask for help. And these activities helped us to know plans of each other and to be able to support one another. 
the relocation support. Of course, companies helped their team members to relocate to safer places, as Irina mentioned, either to Eastern European countries or to the west part of Ukraine, and covered all necessary expenses for that. And also some data provided again by the IT Ukraine Association, the 70.8% of IT companies conducted an unplanned relocation abroad. However, 81.5% of those companies who relocated abroad still plan to return their businesses back to Ukraine. And relocation support helped to ensure and create the safe environment so that the team can continue to work in a safe environment. Psychological support is also a huge impact for the teams and in the company where we are currently working in five jars, we are conducting informal online team meetings such as open mics where our team members can share any experiences or discuss any uh, not necessarily technical or job related topics. And uh, happy hours, those are our weekly meetings may aim to just to communicate and to get to know each other better. And daily short 15-minute water cooler talks just to share common coffee breaks with the team. Also, the HR department initiates one-on-one -on -one meetings with the team members, and this is a nice time for the team to share their feedback, to get the support again, or to ask for the help. Some of the companies also hire psychologists so that they can explain what to expect from the war in its certain period, uh, how the body can react on it, and how to actually deal with those reactions. By the way, on the image on this slide, there is a footage provided by one of our team members who joined the happy hour meeting during the power outage. So he was uh, joining with his phone surrounded by candles. And I think that this image proves that those meetings are really very important to us and no one tries to skip them. And 24 per 7 chat rooms with the team members were created. So all these initiatives helped us to ensure our team that they are not alone, that together we can overcome any difficulties and that we are here to support them. The financial support. Um, Companies allocated additional budget not only for the relocation purposes, but also for the volunteering needs, for the one-time payments to buy generators or Starlinks. Uh, the emergency time off was also introduced. That was a special task where team members can lock their time in the, um, for, for the emergency breaks instead of spending their sick leaves or vacation days. By the way, speaking about the vacation, additional time was also provided for the team members who requested it and paid off time for all days when the team members didn't feel ready for work or wanted to work part-time. And it was necessary and I would say essential to stabilize the business process and take care of the team. Here is also some numbers to support the previous slides, in October 2022, Russia carried out a massive missile attack on energy infrastructure facilities in Ukraine, and this in turn led to um, power outages throughout the whole country and the complete blackout. And of course, this situation required anti-crisis measures from the companies, and they had to allocate additional budget for such things as acquisition of generators, using Starlinks, fuel procurement, purchasing power banks, organizing offices or co-working spaces so that the team can safely continue their work. Flexible and careful project management, probably one of my favorite uh, parts to talk about since we are project managers and those approaches relate to our job. And as a project managers, we always should know about the situation that happening with every single member in our team. Our daily stand-up got updated. And by updated, we mean that instead of asking our team members uh, what they were doing yesterday, how they are going to start uh, today, um, instead of this, we are asking, how are you? How do you feel? Do, are you safe? Do you need any help? And similar questions. Also, we maintained de detailed technical documentation for the newly joined developers so that they can dive into the project details easier. As well as we were ready to process flexibility and we also created a so-called what if document. This document describes all necessary actions and steps uh, that our team members should take during the um, emergency or urgent situations. As an example, I can, um, I can say, for example, let's say we have a strict deadline or we have a production deployment scheduled and our tech lead uh, is not available due to the power outage. Or for example, if we have a meeting scheduled with the client and project manager cannot join. So this document describes all these 
uh, steps that we need to take. And uh, I wanted to point here that it's a very detailed planning. We have to be ready to plan everything, not neither in months, not in quarters, but in hours. The transparent communication with the clients was always our high priority and it remained the same. So we are providing updates to our clients in a timely manner and we, um, always, we are always honest with them. And we are also extremely thankful for their support, for their understanding and for the help that they provide for us. And of course, as a project managers, we need to take care of ourselves as well because we are leading the teams. We need to motivate, to inspire, and in order to do that, we need to keep calm and not give it into panic by ourselves. And to conclude, understanding the situation and risks helped us in managing expectations and staying always on top of uncontrollable circumstances. The hiring didn't stop, and according to Genie Analytics, which is one of the most popular hiring websites for the IT developers in Ukraine, in 2022, hires went down by 13%, and this happened for the first time in the last 10 years. However, despite of all of the challenges Ukrainian IT faced, we managed to adapt, and in 2022, Five Jars has grown by 15%, since 2023 by 44%, which is the great result, and yes, we are, we are keep straightening our team with the new members. Let's now talk a little bit about the lessons we learned as a company. Oh, first of all, we accepted the challenge. Ukrainian IT show has shown its resilience. We definitely improved our risk management skills because war taught us how to mitigate various risks simultaneously, such as members' availability, relocation, temporary accommodation, purchasing generators, and so on. And as one of the major principles of Agile, we definitely know how to adapt to changes quickly now. Safety of our team is always a top priority. Needless to add anything here. We are keep doing what we love with the high quality to make our world better. And this is our motivation and this is what inspires us. And also during the interviews, we now place greater emphasis on selecting team members because we are trying to build the community with uh, people of common principles and views. And our recruiting team has already developed new tools that help them during the interviews. Also, we asked uh, the founders of Five Jars about the changes they have experienced in 2023 comparing to the previous year, and I wanted to share some insights. It has become clear how to react and what to prepare for. The only one thing that has become more challenging is that the team in Ukraine has grown, and it means that now we have more responsibility for the guys and we need to show more care. The main lesson learned this year is that we need to be flexible and need to be ready to cover each other. We must not forget about our families and loved ones because it is their direct support that enables us to do what we do. And uh, shortly would like to share some lessons that we learned as a team. First of all, we became more cohesive than ever and it's not only internally within our team, but it's also uh, cohesive with the clients. Work has become a way to stay sane. Uh, Ukrainian people, uh, shown their strengths of mind and that they can adapt to any different circumstances so we can work even from the bomb shelters, but we don't want to adapt to this. And that's why we are trying to um, improve everything that we can and the company tries to help their team members to continue working in a safe and comfortable uh, conditions. Support for the economy is perceived as a personal challenge. That's also true because uh, during the war, every Ukrainian has their own mission and by doing what we love and pr by providing and keep providing high quality services, we are also helping our economy and um, our country in general. We have one common goal. Life goes on. I would say here that I'm very amazed by uh, Ukrainian people, how they preserve their sense of humor, how they stay positive, how they uh, remain strong, especially including the fact that there is no, no more work-life balance. The new reality is called war work-life balance. And uh, if you have colleagues in Ukraine, uh, please keep it in mind. And this is something that needs to be respected and uh, worth put attention to. Thank you, Stasia. Uh, now let's talk a bit about the real stories of Ukrainian developers who became volunteers and at the same time they are defenders of Ukraine. Uh, here on the slide you may see Andrei Luhvishik, 
Andre is our colleague. He is a front-end engineer at Five Jars, but at the same time, he is a volunteer at Assembly of God Church in Lutsk. And as part of his volunteering activities, he delivers humanitarian aid and covers some military needs. By military needs, I mean he is providing uniforms, sleeping bags, protein, generators, and stuff like that. When we asked Andre what keeps you motivated, he said, you may see his quote on the uh, slide, that many people are used to what's been happening for the last year. However, he is inspired by those people who keep fighting no matter how difficult their lives are. By difficulties, I just want you to imagine that people who spent about eight months under occupation, they might have no water, no light, no roof over their head, but they keep fighting and just show, keep showing their strengths. And um, I usually come to Andre for videos because when I was presenting similar topic in Pittsburgh, he was sharing a video with me from one of his recent volunteering trip. This video is a new one. Uh, you probably heard in June what Russia did to Kherson area when they destroyed Kahovska Dam. And actually, Andre was one of the first and his team as well, who went there uh, with his humanitarian purposes. And he actually shared a video, just short video, up to one minute, where you may see Andre and uh, actually what he as hint as and his team were doing during that time. That's him. And wherever we would be, Ваша допомога, your help is very important. Is very important. And, and, uh, on the land and uh, unfortunately in the water. That's real houses, Thank how you. they look like after this. Okay, uh, Anatoly, I, I'm sure <laughs> the most of you know him. Uh, Anatoly is a software architect at Imagex. And he has been working with Drupal since 2006, and he has been registered at Drupal.org for 10 years already. He is an active Drupal contributor, and at the same time, since 2022, he is defending our country as part of the armed forces of Ukraine. Anton, uh, Anton Martinuk is a Drupal developer at OpenBet. Uh, he has been working with Drupal since 2015, on Drupal.org, he's staying for eight years already. He's an active Drupal contributor, and he also defending our country as part of the armed forces of Ukraine. This is his, actually, real picture. And uh, I was thinking what would be the best way to summarize all these slides, and uh, I found a quote by our president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, he said that our victory in this war will be shared by everyone who was bringing it closer. So glory to every Ukrainian hero. Hero in Slava. Thank you. But, uh, you know, to support the previous slides, I would say, because my husband, uh, he is not uh, part of Drupal community, but he is also a developer. And uh, I know these guys, and I know my family's story. Uh, they managed to combine doing their important job in the morning, I mean, defending our country, and they still find time to work. So my husband, he works probably 24-7. When I ask him how you manage to handle this, he said that, you know, it, it's something that keeps me alive. So I'm doing this unusual job for me, 
uh, in the morning and in the evening, and then at night he can just uh, keep coding because this is something that keep him at least his mental health is stable by all these actions he is doing. Same as people that we just discussed. So how currently we are, and how we are preparing for uh, upcoming winter season. I found another quote that I think fit in the best <laughs> the idea of these slides. Uh, it was said by Dmitro Kuleba, uh, he is a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. He said that working in Ukraine during war is challenging, but feasible, and he was right. Uh, so, I don't know, this is my answer to <laughs> the question how we are doing, so I just kind couldn't find some proper words, so this is the jeep that probably describes it best. However, if uh, I were asked how we are doing, I would answer that we are swimming in the storm. However, we are resilient and we keep control, we keep focus on those things we can control. What we can control? I can control my mental health, I can control my family situation, my work, the environment that is around me, and uh, of course the routine, the stuff that I'm doing on a daily basis, which keeps me at least alive. Uh, there was actually a survey conducted in June 2023 by Rating Sociological Group, and uh, they were trying to ask people from Ukraine how they maintain their resilience. So the um, survey showed some results. 86% of Ukrainian answered that they maintain resilience due to their faith in the armed forces of Ukraine. 61% of people feel support from family and loved ones, loved ones, and this is the main factor for them. And 31% of people are holding on due to daily work. There were some other answers, of course, such as faith in the state, faith in God, volunteering and donations. And of course, uh, some certain percent of people uh, said that they can maintain their resilience by just uh, eliminating news. Uh, how we support each other, we meet, and uh, this is a picture, an image from the event that was organized by our Ukrainian friends, the branch agency. They supported the initiative of Drupal Global Contribution Weekend at the beginning of 2023. They organized and hosted a seventh in the row event in Lutsk, and Lutsk is known as Drupal capital in Ukraine. We support the country and these images represent some examples of how this support looks like. So we are, we are winning camouflage nets for the military. We are providing meals for Ukraine, military and civilian. By the way, uh, the girl, which is like the second one on the photo is our lead of recruitment at Five Jars. And she just shared this photo with me. And we are receiving and sorting humanitarian aid. Uh, by the way, this image, it's actually a cinema hall. <laughs> it used to be a cinema before the war. Now it's a humanitarian uh, center and hopefully it will become cinema again. Uh, we support each other. Actually, we know that we are overcoming these challenges together as a team. And I would say it feels much more bigger than a team. It's now kind of a small family. And we meet, we talk to each other because we have this common context around us. And uh, we have a photo shoot recently in summer. Just I just stole this picture from my marketing team. Um, how I am preparing as a Ukrainian for my winter season. So there were some equipment that I knew about in 2022. Now I know how the generators look like, um, what the power stations are, and I think I'm already an advanced user of Starlinks, so I know how to order them <laughs> and how to configure them. So these are kind of the things that I have in my house and hopefully they will help me to stay uh, fine during the upcoming winter season. Thank you, Irina. And we would like to finish our presentation with telling you how we are back in our team and share some recommendations on how you can support your Ukrainian colleagues or friends. So first of all, our team is fully distributed. We have people all of all, all of the roles located in Ukraine and in other countries, and we are trying to allocate our talents in the way that we all can always cover for each other. 
As I mentioned before, we give team members extended vacations if they feel that they need to. And as a project managers, we are also putting more attention to our planning so that we plan everything around those time of plans. And some of the team members relocated abroad for this winter season. How can you support your Ukrainian colleagues and teams? The first tip is to create a trauma-informed environment. This recommendation was actually shared by psychologist and I think that this tip describes basically everything that we mentioned during this presentation. It is very important that if you have your Ukrainian colleagues working with you, don't ignore the fact that there is a war um, in his or her country. Um, sometimes people just need to talk and they really need someone to listen to them and I believe that it's very important to create this open environment where your colleagues may feel safe, where they know exactly that they can get support from their uh, team and their colleagues. So this is about creating the trauma-informed environment. Check-in on one-on-one -on -one meetings. We also discussed it a little bit earlier, but I just wanted to mention here that during the war time, I believe that um, it is necessary to increase the frequency of those one-on-one -on -one meetings with people who are located in the war. Psychological support is vital, and it's very important to timely recognize the fatigue and to convey your team members that sometimes it's better to take one or two days off or even a week if it's needed, uh, rather than pushing themselves through the projects. Um, in order to be more efficient and more productive, it's better to be flexible and give this opportunity to your team members. Donate. This is not a call to action. This is just a recommendation. If you would like to support our country or your friends or colleagues, you can always ask them. Maybe they know someone personally who need help. Otherwise, you can also use the governmental platforms such as United24 if you would like to help. And the last but not least, show empathy, of course. Uh, I also want to mention that the war taught us to appreciate and to value a lot of different small moments, everyday moments in life, and maybe some things that we used to take for granted before, and also many different simple wor words obtained new meanings right now. For example, ask how are you, because currently how the new meaning of how are you is I'm worried about you and I care for you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We would love to hear your feedback if you have anything to share with us. Uh, and if you have any questions, we are here to answer. Yes. I can share. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I meet people and they're from Ukraine and um, maybe refugees or something and or their colleagues. And I don't know if I should, uh, how much I should ask or because I don't want to ask too much and push them. And, but I also want to give them the opportunity to, to talk to me if they want to. So what is the best way uh, to do that? I would say just a simple question. Maybe, uh, maybe it sounds for me too simple, but ask just how are you? And you will understand from person if uh, he or she wants to share like uh, more details, you will listen to a story. If, uh, you know, the person just doesn't open to conversation, they will just let you know that I'm fine. Or maybe ask for, ask for help. So just how are you? You don't need to you know, go dive deep into the details or questions. Just how are you will work. Because I can speak about my experience, right? I can't speak about uh, like all Ukrainian, but uh, if uh, people who I work with, even from different countries, just ask me at the beginning of my day, how are you? It gives me kind of um, warm feelings. You know, just you don't need to ask a lot. Just, just how are you? And I will be ready to answer that. Yes, I'm fine. And inside me, I will be happy. You know that somebody is asking it. At least I can share that. Yeah, all good with us. Thank you. Any other questions? Yep. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Any other questions? I know we're running out of time, but still. Yes, go ahead. Thank you for your question. Would you like to add or would you like me to take this one? I, I would start probably. I would say that the first rule for keeping communication with the client is transparency and be honest. This is the rule that we set for ourselves from the beginning. And uh, as I mentioned in, in the start you know, of my presentation that we didn't mean to hide anything. So my clients who I work with, they know everything which is happening in my life <laughs> with my team. Uh, I try to keep constant communication with them. Uh, uh, I would say in 2023, the situation is, I can't say better, at least it's more predictable. And uh, when the war started, we kept communication with them. You remember we were saying we were planning in hours, so that was the communication that we had with the clients. Good morning, we are like uh, working, everything is okay, the team is available, so we're moving according to the plan. If something went wrong, uh, wrong, I was like jumping in a call with the client saying that, listen, we have this risk. If we, for example, just, just an example, you remember Andrei Wuchwishik, who is our front-end engineer, when this uh, situation happened with the Kahovska dump, he sent me a message. He was assigned to a project I was leading. He sent me a message that, Irina, sorry, I just can't be here next week because I'm going to uh, go to Kherson area and help people. So what are the options? The first thing that I did, I came, I came to the client. I said to him, you know, this is the project we just run in, and this is the guy who is assigned to this project. He will need to go to this area to support people. I do have for you a few options. Either we put on pause this project for a week and we accept this risk that the project will be delayed by one week, or I can just do another way. I can uh, reassign people, just invite another developer to this project, do a quick onboarding, and he will be taking part in this project while Andre will be out. So I would say transparency, honestly, constant communication, and I would say this plan works because we, we work with multiple clients and they appreciate the transparency and you know on different levels like on account level i'm a pmo manager i can ask the client you know from my pmo perspective we usually check with them how they feel about our communication our delivery delivery because uh, they know the situation and i would say all the clients are still with us none of them left us and they appreciated the transparency because they know we trust you you never hide the situation you show like uh, the actual status of the project. If something goes wrong because of the war, we are aware of this. So we trust because we know that you will communicate um, SAP if something goes wrong. I'd like to add something. Uh, I also wanted to mention that the trust that we built with our clients before the war started was a big plus in the beginning. But uh, me personally, after the war started, never faced any critical situations. And this is about your uh, what you were asking about how we are backing up, what we are doing as a team for that. And I wanted to mention that it's very important to be transparent and honest, not only with the clients, but also with your team. And after the war started, we try to share the knowledge about the projects with, the, with all of the team members and try to onboard many more people to those projects. So that in case of emergency, emergency in case of something happened, um, many people can cover for each other during the projects. Maybe that's why we didn't uh, really faced with any critical issues. Yeah, I know if I'm not available, then uh, I'll just let Stasia know and she will cover for me as a PM. Same with the developers. So we have tech leads who are sharing uh, knowledge. Uh, that's why we have these open mics and uh, some in internal informal meetings and people are aware and we have all the roles represented uh, in Ukraine and abroad so that if something happens, somebody can just step in and cover. Thank you. All right, yes, <laughs> yeah, one more.
because of what is happening in a lot of German companies. And uh, another thing, I would add that a lot of German companies also have uh, people outside of Ukraine. Uh, first of all, uh, people in Ukraine, they really deserve it. So it's almost like it really feel like it's not, not important. It's, we, we understand that it's impossible to shut down the whole country. It should be just like uh, uh, from, uh, from time to time in some specific cases and uh, everyone becoming uh, everyone. And a lot of people like at least one sort of uh, company, uh, a workforce is working outside of Ukraine. In a lot of cases, they are also Ukrainians who migrated to Ukraine and we also need to support those people who provide jobs uh, outside of Ukraine too. And uh, so I believe like we have pretty similar situation that if when uh, uh, the project we have been in talk about, it was only like uh, maybe some delayed during a couple of uh, first uh, days, it's actually not weeks, even days, when we postponed something, uh, communicated directly, like uh, during the first days, we have communicated to our friends what is happening with our, our actions. And now we always measure what is happening, uh, like uh, how many uh, delays we have, like during 2023, as Joel said, uh, we have no delays at all in, uh, on any project. So this is uh, really important, like it's uh, definitely like pretty, Crazy risk free working with Ukrainians at this moment. So I think like we we really take it this seriously. We have uh, always improving uh, our uh, business and continuity plan. We have always backup in terms of energy and internet. So it's definitely something that uh, we cannot just keep work Ukrainians by surviving the war. So we also we can also uh, make sure that everything would be covered, which, which is us policy to make to make sure that we are covered. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for those who came, who listened, who asked questions. Thank you all.